Thank you. Um, pardon, I'm sorry. We didn't, you know, intend to put you in a in a hard situation, but just so you see, you know, I'm put myself in a much worse place because I'm speaking after David and right before lunch, right? <laughs> so I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch. Um, <coughs> Anyhow, so just a, a quick note. I mean, yeah, this, this wasn't really intentional. Uh, I wasn't supposed to talk today. But the person who was supposed to couldn't come. Um, we, uh, we had invited a professor from Campinas, and he recently became dean of research there. Campinas is the best university in Latin America. So he's very busy right now. He couldn't come. And then I had to, I had to step in. That's so that's even worse now, you know, because uh, replacing for someone Quite good. Um, <coughs> all right, so what I'm going to talk about today is this oops, exploring um, the relationship between thermal conductivity and elastic modulus or elastic strength into the carbon based materials. Just a few words before everybody knows where we are, right? Everybody has must have seen a similar map. Um, Natal has some really nice views. So this one you can see from close to your hotel. Um, it's uh, one of the landmarks. There is this old fortress here and uh, a new bridge that goes this way here. Um, David saw this yesterday. Oh, this is the bridge from, from down there. <laughs> this is the view close to, to your hotel. And uh, we also have just a bit outside of Natal, the largest cashew tree in the world. And it's, uh, it's quite impressive. That's what it looks like inside. So this is a whole, you know, larger than a block of, of houses. And uh, from, from in there, that's what it looks like. And, uh, you know, since it's a giant cashew tree, it has giant cashew fruit, right? So <laughs> the size of a person, but, you know, it's not really. It's, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's fake. Um, let me tell you a, a little bit about our university here. So it's a, it's a public university funded by the federal government. It was formally established in 1960. Um, today we have about 37,000 students enrolled in 84 undergraduate programs and 86 graduate programs. Uh, <coughs> three of these graduate programs are among the best in Brazil. It's physics, material science, and behavioral neuroscience. I mean, in their own areas, let's say. In the physics department, we have 34 permanent faculty members now we are we are hiring more people um, <coughs> we teach about 300 undergrads in three undergraduate degrees and uh, we have about 110 graduate students uh, working in mostly in condensed matter physics and, and astrophysics it's also a strong group in astrophysics here uh, just the IIT so the, the International Institute of Physics has, the, has its mission to promote the internationalization of uh, the university and Brazilian physics in general. Uh, it hosts international events such as this one, you know, schools and workshops throughout the year. And there are visiting positions for professors, postdocs, and graduate students. So if you're interested in spending some time in Natal, you can contact uh, the IIP people. Now let's, let's go to, to the serious stuff. Um, <coughs> what's the, if someone asks you what's the hardest known material offered, what would you say? It's diamond, yes. Correct answer. Um, <coughs> now, what, what m many people might not know is what is the material with the highest thermal conductivity known? It's also diamond. Uh, well, the thing is, the, the answer to these questions are, is a bit outdated because uh, in the last couple of decades, so nanotubes were first observed in 91 and then graphene in 2004, they have taken diamond's crown in some sense. Um, so, <coughs> oops. Of course, I mean, diamond is a, this bulk material, so um, it's, it, it's a mechanical strength goes when you try to compress it and when you try to, to, st to stress it, right? Whereas for graphene and nanotubes, it's very easy to compress them. It's very hard to stress them. 
Um, there are many other carbon allotropes, right? Besides diamond, there's graphite, uh, this long delayed thing, which I learned recently uh, might be a, a metastable. These fullerenes, amorphous carbon, nanotubes. But let's, uh <coughs> what I'm going to do, oops, is what I want to do is look at mechanical properties and thermal transport properties with molecular dynamics. That's essentially the main tool I'm going to use here. So if, if, you, if I take, how do we do, how do we strain the material? I mean, I take my graphene sample here. I stretch it in this direction, like this. And then I calculate uh <coughs> the, the elastic modulus as the stress divided by the strain, so the change in size of the material. I, I pull it at the rate of 2 times 10 to the 8 per second. Okay? Of course, the simulation never gets to a second. It, it breaks much before that. Now, uh, let me tell you two words about phonons and heat transport. So these phonons are these vibrational modes in a crystal lattice. In the case of graphene, your unit cell has two atoms. And you, you can reproduce everything here with translations from, from this unit cell. Uh, <coughs> and usually, when you have n atoms in the unit cell, there are three n normal modes. So in the case of graphene, you have three acoustic modes and then three optical modes. And oops, what makes graphene really special is this, this mode here. So these two modes, the longitudinal and transverse, they have linear dispersion relations. But this mode here has quadratic dispersion. This is the mode that corresponds to deformations out of plane, so vibrations out of the graphene plane. Um. <coughs> so one way to calculate um, the, uh, the phonon thermal conductivity uh, is solving the Boltzmann transport equation. Right? So in, in the end, you can, you, if you can solve it with some simple approximations, you say that the thermal conductivity is the sum of the conductivity of several different phonon modes. And uh, each phonon mode contributes with a specific heat capacity, um, a group velocity, and its uh, mean free path. Now, this is very easy to calculate. Okay? Um, we know the correct Bose-Einstein statistics, so it's easy to find. The group velocities are easy to find as well. It's just the derivative of the phonon dispersion curves. But this guy is quite difficult to calculate. So uh, instead of using this to calculate the thermal conductivity, we're going to use molecular dynamics. <coughs> um, again, you see in this, this, uh, this book, right? And uh, I'm showing it here. The, the, the authors, one of them is here. The other one is Kurt Binder. Um, <coughs> it's the first time I saw this, uh, this triangle was in this book, not in this edition, an older edition. And I, I, it was some sort of you know, changing moment for myself because I, 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 I knew I wasn't a theorist. I knew I wasn't an experimentalist. So I didn't really know what I was. And uh, when I saw this, I, I realized, okay, you know, that's how I'm going to approach nature, neither through theory nor experiment, but through computer simulations. And that's what I've been doing for, well, a few years. <laughs> and uh, for, th for, for this, we use, of course, our super modern computers. This is uh, just a very old one. Um, and in molecular dynamics, we solve Newton's equations of motion for each atom. Right? So we calculate the acceleration from the force, and then we calculate the velocity for the next step and the position for the next step, uh <coughs> and then we go back to the acceleration again. Now, these forces can come from interatomic potentials or force fields, more simplified, like Lena Jones, Tersoft, Brenner, Reacts, and so on and so forth. And you can control pressure and temperature via thermostats and barostats. There are different types as well. Um, and normally, you, you can use periodic or free boundary conditions. I'm going to use both. I'm going to show some simulations with most with periodic boundary conditions, but some also with free boundary conditions. So let's begin with graphene. 
Uh, we use this terce of potential, which was originally proposed for carbon, silicon, and germanium in bulk form, but it was reparametrized by these guys in 2010, specifically for graphene and nanotube. So this is, these are the phonon dispersions from the potential or the continuous lines, and the, and the, the points are from neutron scattering experiments. Right? So it, gets a, it, it, it describes really well the acoustic modes. It doesn't describe the, the optical modes so well, but it doesn't matter because most of the heat is transported by the acoustic modes anyway. Okay. <coughs> so we use non-equilibrium molecular dynamic simulations, which are very similar to what is actually done in the in the lab. Um, we can heat up part of the system and cool down the other part. So this creates a temperature gradient, which then comes up, comes with oh, from which follows a heat flux follows, right? Um, <coughs> This is the, the, the called direct method. There's another way of doing this, which is the reverse method or the Müller-Platten method, in which you impose a heat flux, and then you get a, grad a temperature gradient from that. So how do we do? You impose this temp this um, heat flux. You take the s the atoms with smallest velocity in the hot area, and move it, move them to the cold area, and then you take the atoms with the highest velocity in the cold area, in the hot area, and move to the, sorry, in the cold and move to the hot. So with that, I mean, it's very easy to calculate the, the heat flux because it's just the difference in kinetic energy of these guys. Uh, the problem is the phonons, of course, I mean, this is connected to a thermostat and this to another thermostat, and usually we can leave our system with no thermostat after it's been equilibrated. So the phonons can only really propagate in this area here. Uh, and <coughs> that is to say, as you increase your system length in the direction of heat transport or in the direction of the heat flux, uh, your thermal conductivity will change. Or the thermal conductivity you calculate from your simulation will change. Okay? Uh, in general, the, the, the thermal conductivity should go like this. The inverse of the thermal conductivity for a given side, size is the inverse intrinsic thermal conductivity plus some function that depends on the length of the system. So for graphene, we choose the hot region in the middle, and then we have a cold region in the center. And we use periodic boundary conditions here, so there is, a, there is an image of the cold area here. You get the heat flux going to both sides. And then this is what happens. It has a transient period, and then it eventually it becomes stationary. And uh, we can calculate the temperature gradient just by averaging, taking the average kinetic energy in different slabs of the material, and you use equipartition theorem to calculate the temperature there. So once you have all the temperatures, you can easily calculate the temperature gradient. And with heat flux and temperature gradient, you use Fourier law to calculate the thermal conductivity. We did that, and then we found uh, some results that we didn't expect which was the thermal conductivity of graphene kept increasing. Uh, <coughs> increase actually, um, well, increasing in a very specific form. We did that first with, uh, with the, the direct method. And then when we got that result, we said, no, this is obviously wrong. Let's try something else. So the first thing we tried was the reverse method. Um, and we got exactly the same, the same data. Now. We are doing a, a dirty trick here, which is we are increasing the system only in one direction, right? So the width is, is even though we have periodic boundary conditions, the width is finite, which means as you, for the system, when the system gets really large, then the aspect ratio of the system is very high. So it's almost a one-dimensional system in a way. And we were, we were worried about that, okay, maybe this effect comes from, from this one-dimensionality. But and so we we went back and we did simulations with square patches, for with uh, well, I don't know here it's a hundred, about hundred thousand atoms, three million, eleven million, and uh, it's all within the trend we had before. We also did it at higher temperature, and we also got a similar behavior. This is for one thousand Kelvin, so 
what we conclude from here is that the thermal conductivity goes with the log of the system size. And we were very happy with this at the time because th that's what you would expect for a 2D system. The, the thermal conductivity in a 2D system should uh, diverge with the log of the system size. But graphene is not really 2D. I mean, you know, sure, you have the atoms in a, in a plane, but they can also move out of plane. And this makes it, uh, you know, doesn't make it uh, two-dimensional anymore. Now, we didn't know how to, how to solve that, and uh, we thought very hard about it. And we started going to, to conference and presenting these results, even though we couldn't understand them fully. And then after one of the talks, someone approached us and said, listen, we have experimental data that is exactly like your, what, your, what your simulations are telling you. And we can't publish it because we don't have a we don't have an explanation. So we put everything together. Uh, <coughs> this is at the measurements they did at 300k, one at 120k. So the graphene patch is here. It, they pass a current through this platinum bit here, and it heats up. So this is the cold bit. It's connected to something with a colder temperature, and the graphene patch is here. And they can do this for increasing separation between these guys. So you can increase the size of your graphene patch there. They do that. They get this behavior here, uh, <coughs> which if we change it to log scale, right, you get this is the experimental data. So the experiment is always a bit more complicated than the simulations. In, in, the, in the, the experiment, it's very hard to determine the interface thermal resistance between the platinum and, graph and graphene. So they, they have different estimates here. That's what these different curves represent for uh, values for of this uh, interface thermal resistance. But in any case, you get this logarithmic dependence, okay, in agreement with our simulation. And, we, you know, we put everything together. We published it. You know, we were very happy about it. But uh, as a physicist, I, I wasn't satisfied. Thermal conductivity is a property of the material. You cannot depend on the system size. Uh, so is it really length dependent for graphene? Turns out it's not. Uh, a few months after our work, someone went and improved uh, our results. They solved the Boltzmann transport equation exactly for graphene. And then what they saw was that if they only included single phonon excitations, the thermal conductivity seemed to converge much earlier, but then if they included the full collective behavior of the phonons, then the thermal conductivity would keep increasing up to about 10 micrometers and then st stabilize, right? So we did simulations up to, um, up to three microns, and the, our experiments were also in that, in that region. Um, and then, okay, so you know you can't use molecular dynamics, bo but the Boltzmann transport equation gives you the right result. Actually, molecular dynamics also gives you the, the correct answer. Sometime after that, uh, Luciano Colombo and his group, they showed that using a, 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 some uh, method called approach to equilibrium, MD, they could actually get the correct result. So the, the exact BTE solution is here and the data points are from their simulations with this, with this method. So MD is OK. Um, and then we went back and we revisited our original results. Okay? So at the time, we didn't know exactly what the dependence of the thermal conductivity with the size was. So uh, then we figured out it's something like this. I mean, we didn't come up with it. It's, it's been in the literature for many years, just written in different forms. and then. Um, we did new simulations. We did. We got our old simulations, both from the direct and, and the reverse method, and we did a, a fit to this equation to this data, and then we get a thermal conductivity of about 3,100 watts per meter kelvin, which is very close to the experimental number, which is between 2,000 and 4,500. But the error bars are huge. Um, so this was very nice for us. It this got published this year. It's very nice for us to have you know, our old results vindicated. In the end, we were not wrong. We just didn't look at systems that were large enough. <coughs> so just to summarize, the thermal conductivity of graphene does 
converge up uh, after a certain point, but you need samples of the order of one millimeter. And you know, you need good quality samples of one millimeter. That's really difficult to make in the lab. Now, how about other 2D carbon materials? How do they behave? This is something I did years ago, and we never right, quite got it together to publish, but I, we, we looked at graphene with folds, with crests. So we, we take the graphene sheet, we compress it like this, and then it forms a bulge, and then we replicate that thing many times. And then you end up with this, with this structure here. And we look at the thermal transport in this direction, and we see that it does converge with, uh, with the system length much earlier than, than we would, uh, than we, we saw for graphene. Um, the sentence was in a, in a solid state physics book, I think maybe the first book I, I looked at. And I, I also found it very interesting. It says, you know, crystals are like people, it's the defects that make them interesting. So let's look at systems with defects. Um, back in, uh, in 2015, the group of Yannick Maya in Vienna, they took perfectly good graphene, high quality graphene, and they bombarded it with ions. In this case, gallium ions. And uh, what happens is when you hit the carbon with this, with these other atoms, you create defects. So a gallium atom comes and hits a carbon, the carbon gets out, and you, know, you, you end up with graphene with full of defects. So that's what they did. And the longer you, you expose the material to the, to the beam, the more defects you will have. So they have, uh, they have control over that to some extent. And then you see you end up with a, a, the numbers here indicate the number of, si of, of vertices in this polygon. So you, you end up not only with hexagons, but pentagons, heptagons, even octagons. So we, we wanted to do something like that. I mean, we want to simulate that something like that. And uh, the easiest way to introduce this defect is actually via stone whales deforma uh, deformation. So what is it? You take your graphene lattice like this, you take this carbon bond here and rotate it 90 degrees. Now you have two pentagons and two heptagons. Now you take another bond, say these ones, and rotate them as well. And then you end up with one pentagon and uh, should be an oct uh, two, oct two pentagons and two octagons, right? So by choosing random bonds and rotating them by 90 degrees, we can generate a lot of defects in, a, in our graphene patch. Uh, we, defi we define the defect concentration as the number of hexagons divided by the number of non-hexagons or, non or the remaining, oh yeah, the initial he he hexagons at the beginning and uh, the defects that we introduce. Uh, <coughs> this is a 50 by 50 nanometer patch on almost 100,000 atoms. And then we begin by looking at uh, its mechanical strength. We start pulling it, and uh, you get to a point where it starts to break. If you look in a smaller scale here, you see that uh, you have larger defects. And then eventually this thing breaks and ruptures. Um, we did that for different defect concentrations, so increasing from 5% to 35%. And what we see is that not only the slope here decreases, but also, um, sorry, but the, the stress at which it breaks decreases as well, but the strain at which it breaks increases. So the more defects, the more you can pull it before it breaks. But it, you know, it, it, of course, the easier it is to pull it. Um, we look at the elastic modulus and the elastic s the tensile strength, which is the, the stress at rupture, uh, as a function of temperature. And then we see, in for def increasing defect concentration, we see, I mean, uh, you know, the expected behavior at higher temperature, the elastic modulus is, is smaller. But still, I mean, the elastic modulus here for a, a, a sample with 35% defect is 500 gigapascal. This is half of graphene, which is one, one terapascal. So this, is, this material is still very, very, very tough to pull. Uh, so we wanted to look at the thermal conductivity for that thing. And then we had a problem. 
because when we did our non-equilibrium simulations, this, the sample kept uh, breaking and disintegrating, essentially. The problem is you have when you have these too many defects and you increase the temperature too much, uh, you, you know, you lose atoms and this kind of stuff. So we had to go back and use equilibrium MD in which we can calculate each component of the thermal conductivity tensor from an integral of the heat flux autocorrelation function. The problem is the original um, formulation of the heat flux, of this heat flux in this the software we use, LAMPS, um, is incorrect. Well, it's incorrect for many body potentials. It is correct for Lena Jones or any other two body potential, but we showed in a, in a, in a work in 2015, it's not, it doesn't give you the right uh, heat flux for, for many body potentials like Tersoff and uh, stealing a web and so on. So if you're going to use, uh, if you're going to calculate thermal conductivity with lamps, do not use their standard uh, formulation. Now, we did our, we wrote our own code, and then we calculate the thermal conductivity as a func function of defect concentration, and then, as expected, the thermal conductivity decreases when you have increased the number of defects. But what's interesting here is that uh, for different temperatures, right, the the temp the conductivity is almost the same, which means that the, the conductivity there is completely limited by the defects. The phonon phonon scattering is almost unimportant. Um, <coughs> now, there is a big reduction of the thermal conductivity, right? Graphene was about 3,000. Here you have 100, from 100 to about 20 watts per meter Kelvin. We try to understand why is it so much smaller than in graphene, and we calculate these group velocities, which are obtained from the slope of the dispersion curves. And then we have here the black dots are for pristine graphene, and then the red dots are for the deformed graphene. So Overall, the phonon modes in deformed graphene have much lower um, group velocities. Therefore, you get a lower thermal conductivity. So we go, we go to this, this plot. This is thermal conductivity versus elastic modulus. Graphene is up here. Amorphized graphene is down here. I'm going to keep adding points on, on this graph. So th there's too much more carbon or 2D carbon than graphene. There are many things that have been produced in the lab recently. Um, <coughs> for example, in 2015, this group in Korea produced uh, nit what they call nitrogenated holy two-dimensional structures of carbon. So you have carbon atoms here, which are the, the green ones. You have carbon hexagons terminated by nitrogen atoms. They actually produced this in the lab, you know, chemical reaction. and uh, we wanted to, to look at this. And we first thing we look at the phonon dispersion. Now the unit cell has a lot more atoms than in graphene, so you have we have a lot more modes. But with the poten the same potential we used before, we get no negative or no imaginary frequencies. Okay, so this the structure should be stable, or our potential should be good enough for that structure. We impose a heat flux in the usual way, and then we calculate the thermal conductivity for three different temperatures by adjusting this, this curve, this equa equation here, to our simulation data with nice arrow bars. Uh, <coughs> and then we get both the intrinsic thermal conductivity for this material, as well as an effective phonon mean free path, which is this guy that appears here. This, we have to be very careful with this guy. I mean, it's, it's like, it's the average mean free path over all phonon modes, right? It's not a very good measure because what happens in practice is that you have a very few phonons with long mean free path and most phonons with a very short mean free path. So your mean free path end up ends up being much smaller than the maximum mean free path you have in your system. But it's, it's, it's just an estimate and you see that it decreases with temperature as well. Skip this. Okay, so let's look at the mechanical properties of this thing. We start pulling this material until it breaks. This is done at 800K, but we also did it at many other temperatures. Uh, and then we have, so here's 300K, 
400, 500, 600, 7, 8. The highest the temperature, the sooner this guy breaks, right? You have more uh, agitation of the, of the atoms there, and sooner it breaks. But still, I mean, it, uh, so its thermal conductivity is not very high, but it still has a pretty decent uh, elastic module. Um, <coughs> Another material that was produced in the lab was these carbon anine uh, structures. So it's this thing here. Each you have carbon atoms here, and then they form these uh, these structures. And this thing is periodic. They made you know single sheets, single layer sheets out of this thing. Here it's, is it on top of copper. So we we went and we simulated that as well. We began with uh, looking at the mechanical properties this, this time. And what we saw was very unusual behavior. So for a, an uniaxial strain, when we pull it only along one direction, we get this, this kind of behavior here, which is really not what we expected. So essentially, we have a very small elastic modulus here. But when we pull it equally on the x and y directions, right, then we get a different behavior for the stress along each of those directions. Now, we look at, you know, this is the elect elect electron density as the, this thing ruptures. We did this with uh, Abinitia MD. We also looked at the stability of the structures with, with uh, Abinitia MD. You see it's stable up to 1500 Kelvin, so you can go to very high temperatures and it's still there. And finally, we calculate the thermal conductivity, and then we see the thermal conductivity is actually anisotropic. So it's not the same in the, say, x and y directions in the plane. It's actually, it's much higher in the x direction and much smaller. We, I d I'm not gonna add that one. To if you see, it's, it's still in, this, art, this paper has been accepted a few weeks ago, still in press. Um, I'm not going to add that to my thermal conductivity versus elastic modulus plot because I don't know how to w which elastic modulus to use yet. I'm still thinking about it. <coughs> now, there is really plenty of 2D carbon, including things that don't exist yet. For example, there was this uh, this nanoletters paper in 2015 where they show this um, phagraphene. They, as they call it, for pentagon, heptagons, hexagons, graphene. Um, so it's carbon, pure carbon, with uh, on top of of uh, hexagons you also have another other polygons. And the thing is, this has a has an entropy of formation very close to graphene. So even though it hasn't been synthesized, maybe it could, right? It's a good indication that it uh, it, it could. We do the same thing with, with the potential. We look at our phono modes. We get no imaginary frequencies. And then we calculate the thermal conductivity. Here I'm plotting the inverse thermal conductivity versus inverse length, right? So this thing becomes linearized. And uh, from the intersection here, I have the, this intrinsic thermal conductivity. And from the slope, I can get the uh, effective phono mean free path. We also broke this thing, and now since uh, we saw that the, the behavior was anisotropic for the thermal conductivity, we also expected it to happen in, uh, for the mechanical properties, so we pulled it along one direction and then another, uh, and along the other direction, every, uh, always ju just pulling in one direction, and then you see it breaks. Now, it breaks at different points in the armchair direction, it breaks before, whereas in the zigzag direction it breaks a bit later. But the, the, st the mechanical strength, which is this uh, stress at, uh, at rupture, is almost the same. Okay. <coughs> so we get um, summary, and then I add it here. There are two points because there are two different values for the elastic modulus and thermal conductivity, but they are kind of close. Um, there's also these other 2D carbon allotrope. So this is, let me see. This was some people called octagraphene. This is called biphenylene. And this is a hecalite. 
Uh, they, are, they all have, so here you only have squares and, and octagons. Here you have squares, hexagons, and octagons. And here you have pentagons, hexagons, and heptagons. Uh, we look at the entropy of formation of e each one of these structures. So octagraphene is, is much higher than graphene. The same for this hacolite. But that uh, biphenylene structure is very close to phagraphene. So again, maybe these things could be produced in the lab. I don't know. Maybe they would be metastable. I have to see. We look at the phonon dispersions, and they are, the again, no imaginary frequencies. So we know we can use our potential. And then we look at the thermal conductivity. So we begin with the octagraphene, and then we, we get this data from our simulation, and we do the fitting to get the, the intrinsic thermal conductivity in the effective phonomine free path. Then we do the same. Oh, so in the case of octagraphene, it's, it's isotropic, so x and y direction are the same. I'm reporting only one here. Um, for the biphenylene structure, you, we have an, an, an isotropic uh, thermal conductivity, and also, well, and then for the hackalite, we have what appears to be also an isotropic um, thermal conductivity. But the thing is, I'm not showing my arrow bar here, and you know, it's it's within the difference. So maybe this one is, doesn't have a, an isotropic thermal conductivity. We probably never know because it's probably never going to be made in the lab. Um, <coughs> anyhow, so I can add my octagraphene here, my biphenylene here, and the hackelite here, right? And you know, you clearly see there is a there is a clear trend here. Uh, this is you know, no specific equation I'm using, just showing just a line showing that you have. Uh, a trend of increasing thermal conductivity as you increase the elastic modulus. As uh, you know, uh, we expected from where I began talking about diamond. But there are points that are out of this trend. So amorphized graphene, even though it still has a high, a high elastic modulus, it has a low thermal conductivity. It's easy to understand that. The low thermal conductivity comes from the defects. It's full of defects, so phonons can't propagate. The high mechanical strength, or elastic modulus, comes from the chemistry of the material. So even though you have plenty of defects, you still have mostly carbon sp2 bonds there. And these are very strong. So that's why it's hard to, to break the material. Um, <coughs> I also think that graphene is out of, uh, is out of the trend. I think that graphene uh, is on the, o on the other end of, um, of amorphized graphene. And the problem in graphene is that the, the phonomene free path is really large. So you get a really high thermal conductivity. Right. Um, <coughs> this is some work I've done since I arrived here with my first graduate student. Uh, we got this paper in the literature where they made um, heterostructures of boronitride and graphene. You know, with very fairly sharp edges. So we go on our computer and we can make the same. We make a super lattice of graphene boronitride, and uh, the super lattice period is this lambda here, the system length Lx, and these are these are ribbons. So these are finite width, really. We don't use periodic boundary conditions in the in the perpendicular direction. And we go and calculate the thermal conductivity as a function of that super lattice period. And what we see is we begin with a small period, and then the thermal conductivity is high. Then we increase the lattice period to, 40 to oops, 172, and it decreases the thermal conductivity. We increase the lattice parameter more, and then we decrease even more. And then as we, as we increase the lattice parameter again, the thermal conductivity increases, right? So essentially, we have this non-monotonic behavior. This is for the thermal conductivity. This is for the, the red ones, or for the effective phonon mean free path. We are fin finalizing that work, right? Uh, <coughs> so just to conclude, whatever mechanical or 
thermal properties you need is probably a carbon-based 2D material that will do the job for you. Um, <coughs> so this is our, our this group. Rafael is a postdoc working with me. Isaac finished his master's and is doing his PhD now. Gustavo finished his master's recently. And these guys are undergrads. I'm trying to keep on the, on the right path. And of course, I didn't do all those things alone. I have plenty of collaborations. Davide Donadio in Davis, uh, Boaira and Timon in Weimar, Ari and uh, Zeyong in, in um, Helsinki. So just for the students in the audience, our graduate program takes applications twice a year. So if you're interested in doing a master's or PhD, working with this kind of stuff, um, get in touch with us. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>